Oh no, says Edward Carnby. No! He realizes his past sins. And how he has to atone for them now. But can he atone for them? Did the color grading just change as I left that? Kind of looks like it. Well, we know where we need to go. We need to go back to the conservatory. Because they're having a party around a big tree. And let's see. Oh, did we never find a key to that? Okay, no. It's just locking the doors. So we can only go in one way. I was about to say, surely we've opened that door. I don't see how we couldn't have. I can't leave. I got a job to do. Well, I just wanted to see if there was a giant hell anus on the other side of the front door, Carnby. I guess we can't examine that. So where is it directing us? Well, we're going out to the mezzanine, I guess. Maybe. More to these stairs. Actually, what, what room is it up here? Oh, Dr. Gray's apartment. Yeah, we actually have not been in here. Oh, he's got a line the app. That's two out of three for Prisoner of Ice. Oh, we can just go in? Detective, am I glad to see you. Lock the door, will you? I don't think Dr. Gray would appreciate us snooping around. What's going on here? This feels so strange. Detective Conby felt removed from himself. Like driving drunk, he carefully tried to navigate his environment. What the hell was going on? Was he finally losing his mind? At least Emily was here to call the police if he went off the deep end. <laughs> Felt weird, like I was looking down on top of myself, seeing myself walk around the room. But that doesn't make any sense. There's a book missing. Well, we don't have a book on us. There's a the book right here. It's a false book. It says it right there. Book. What did you do? I was just rearranging the books. Well, come on, let's check it out. All right, so uh, have a look around before we leave. Oh, a Lagni app. It's actually the third of that set. No, actually, is it? Is it two or? Th it might it might be only two. Toy Talisman. Yeah, we all, we don't have uh, the third one. We have two for all the worlds a stage. Nice. Nice, he says. Carnby's got his pockets full of tiny trinkets. An objet d'art. Getting little store. I'm beginning to understand. Doctor Gray is dealing with some kind of mass delusion. Hmm. Can curious. Furniture key. Huh. Has that been there this whole time? Is this the first time we've been in here? Hmm. 
Hmm, transcripts. Good to finally meet you, Mr. Hartwood. I'm here on the behalf of your brother Philip. You were expecting me, weren't you? Yes, you're from Desetto, no? That's right. I just wanted to ask you a few questions to see if there is anything I can do to help you and your family. Okay. I understand you're full of imagination. You make up a lot of things. I suppose. And you obsess over them, blurring reality and fiction. Oh, sometimes. Do you want to tell me about the Dark Man? No. No, I, I don't. That's all right. Perhaps there is something else you can tell me. Something you know to be made up, but you hold dear. Juan? John? Who's John? No. Juan Luis Jorge. Oh, wait there a moment. Here, take a look. Is he... Oh, he is the author. It's a magnificent book. Life-changing, even. The real Juan is long dead, but I like to think of him as my, my friend. My most beloved friend. I see. Do you often do this? Fantasize about people you read about? No. No. Well, there is Jacob. Who is Jacob? Turn to the last page. Oh, it's a newspaper article. The Prisoner of Ice, Jacob Van Ostart. Is he also your beloved friend? Oh, no, Doctor. Not at all. He is the fire that fights fire. Yes, I think it's clear your overstimulated imagination, this mania, needs to be tempered for you to live a normal life. I know your family calls it the Hartwood Curse, but I want you to know that there is nothing supernatural about your condition. It's all inside your head. And with that, I'm very qualified to deal with. In time, you will be cured. In time, in time. Yes, in time we will exercise all your demons, all the dark men. Yeah! Please, Mr. Hartwood, calm yourself. What happened? Oh, don't you worry your little head about it, Miss Hartwood. Your uncle and I just had our first breakthrough. Well, what a promising... The floor looks like talisman positions, but from which direction should I look at it? What a promising first meeting. Hmm? Anything in here? I mean, it was locked. Can I get in? No. How odd. The Snake Dagger. A monograph by Yael Klein. In Ludwig Prinz's book on pagan rituals called The Mystery of the Grave, as translated by Nicholas Vachy, there are several references to a sacrificial dagger called the Snake Dagger. It has long been thought of as a poor translation of the original text, that it would be more appropriate with Worm Dagger from the Latin Vermis Cultrum. This seems natural following the recent consensus that the original title of Prinz's book the Vermis Mysteris should literally translate to the mystery of the worm. However, this would take away from Vahi's great effort at translating the underlying meaning of the words and revealing several cultural beliefs. While Prin certainly was using the term worm as a symbol or synecdoche for death and the dead, which is made clear by the contents of the book, in the case of the dagger, we shouldn't be too hasty to dismiss his translation. Reading through Vahi's correspondence with his patron, it appears that he had more than just the Latin text at his disposal. Vahi had dug up Prin's living relatives and uncovered several cross-referenced historical texts and an actual snake dagger. The dagger was dated to the early Middle Kingdom of Egypt and had such a clear shape of a wave that Vahi considered calling it the sinusoidal blade. Knowing the full story, it seems prudent that he chose to translate it as snake and not worm. 
There are several reasons why this choice of word helps us understand the pagans that Prin's book attempts to describe. Oops, not that one. The symbolic value of the shape becomes more apparent when reading about the use for the dagger. In the passage of possession and exorcism, we find the snake dagger poisons the poisoner within the victim and is therefore pacified. Where the literal text would tell us that the worm dagger trumps the demon possessing the victim, it tells us nothing of their reasoning. Only that somehow this dagger wins against the demon, like it had the better hand in poker. Vahi's translation allows us to follow the underlying logic to the ritual magic that is being performed. Poison the poisoner. Sounds like fighting fire with fire. That to hurt the demon possessing its victim, the priests would have to fight back with a power that is known to the evil they are fighting. The snake dagger is therefore not only a good way to describe its form, but it also helps us understand how it could be thought of as a useful tool for exorcism. Finally, it also helps us understand their relationship to lunacy. That it was thought of as something poisoning the mind, rather than controlling it. What is also interesting to note is that the possessed are always considered poisoned in their head, and not their heart. The snake dagger always went to the eye of the possessed, leaving them partially blind, if they had the good luck to survive. All right, sorry, Jeremy, I gotta stab you in the eye with my snake knife. Hopefully you survive it. Uh, I mean, it doesn't sound that different from the, uh, the lobotomy we were hearing about, which goes through the eye, or, you know, around it. But, um, this is a magic one. So that's, and that's good. So the dagger will trump the demon. But, I mean, this information is coming from Ludwig Prin, and, you know, the only experience we've had with his works is that his book killed us in the original game. And I'm not exactly a trustworthy author. But maybe he knows what he's talking about. And I'm still curious as to why there was nothing in here. Well, anyway, we got this down here. Carnby did mention it's a talisman. And was wondering which direction he should consider to be down and up. Maybe it's the direction that we're seeing. I hear a phone. Where is that phone? What were you saying about mass delusion? Dorsetto seems to have a deranging effect on people living close by. It has a history of creating cults devoted to some nature goddess. Even the name Dorsetto refers to the cult existing here before the Civil War. Dorsetto was the name of an ancient fertility goddess worshipped in Syria. Dr. Gray and his friends, however, seem to prefer... the black goat of the woods with a thousand young, or Shubnigroth. And that name can only have come from my uncle's twisted mind. I'm pretty sure Jeremy did not invent that. Oh no, something went wrong with the game. Something went wrong with it. I need to accept and report. Uh, this is obviously madness. Uh, clearly, the black goat with a thousand young has invaded my PS5. Uh, and is making making me hallucinate that the game has crashed. Um, hold on a moment. We got, we just, I'm going to take a second so we can, you know, drink some liquor, which is going to restore our sanity. Um, and take a second to, to calm down and clear our mind. Get back to lucidity. All right, and this is where it started me. So we're all right. Not sure what that was about. Why did it crash? Well, we'll, found anything? we'll probably never know. What? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I've seen some things. Some fucked up things, Emily. I don't know if there is anything you want to talk about? There's plenty I'd like to talk about, but not anything he could talk about. There's a book missing. So the phone's out here on the desk. I was just rearranging the books. Well, come on, let's check it out. 
Do I need to pick up the Lagni app again? No, it's not here. It was on the floor right here, but I, I guess it auto-saved that I have it. I think I'm beginning to understand. Dr. Gray is dealing with some kind of mass delusion. All right, well, let's, uh, let's get this over here. Huh. Has that been there this whole time? What were you saying about mass delusion? Dracetto seems to have a deranged right. effect on people living close by. It has a history of creating cults devoted to some nature goddess. Even the name Dracetto... I mean, they're gonna have a party! ...here before the Civil War. Uh, about, uh, in the, in the conservatory later, Emily, if you want to join. Worshipped in... Everyone's gonna be wearing masks and dancing around the big tree and... ...making sacrifices? It's gonna be a fun time. ...young or Shubnigroth. And that name can only have come from my uncle's twisted mind. You think all of them are oh. in this cult business? Even Jerem? I'm not sure any of them have a choice at this point. We just need to find a way to stop all of this. Uh, okay, yep, okay, I can move. Good to finally... Anything else? I've been so busy trying to free your uncle from the promise he made to the Dark Man. I guess I kind of just let everything else go. Don't worry, Detective. I feel like we're close. I'm sure Jeremy will turn up. If he is part of the cult, he wouldn't want to miss the Feast of St. John. I just need enough information to make him see the truth. I hope you're right, but I doubt he'll show up. Not as long as the Dark Man's got him hiding. Emily, you want to ask Carnby what he's talking about? That mark on the floor looks like talisman positions, but from which direction should I look at it? She's just kind of like, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, detective, dark man, holding, uh, holding Jeremy, prisoner, all right. The snake dagger. All right, is the, um, okay, yeah, phone's ringing. Let's see if we can make it there this time. Okay, it began a cutscene. That's it crashed because a cutscene was starting, I guess. Hello? Detective Convy. Who is this? Jeremy? Jeremy is with the dark man. You can't save him. Well, I've done everything he wanted so far, and there's just one more thing on the list. I expect him to keep his promise and return Jeremy unharmed. Get out, detective. While you still can. Well, Carnby can't do that. He's got a job to do. Detective Conby wanted nothing more than to make sense of it all. But clearly, that was not in the cards right now. Ah, that's where that goes. Well. Oh. We got... Oh, no, no, ah. Okay, so we have symbols around the thing. Just gonna do a little drawing, maybe. Just go, let's see, middle circle, then arrow at the bottom, then medium circle with arrow at bottom, and then large circle with arrow at top. And then, like, on top of it, we have, like, a circle with a horizontal line going through it. Then at one o'clock, a circle with, like, an arc through it. 
two o'clock is like a dot with a circle around it. Three o'clock is like we have like three wavy lines coalescing with each other. Four o'clock is sort of like an S. It's S-ish. Five o'clock is like a, a line that's sort of doing a loop and then a dot beneath it. Six o'clock are like two arrows kissing, sort of. Seven o'clock kind of looks like a pickaxe. We'll say that's what that is. Eight o'clock is similar to two o'clock. Sort of like a circle with a dot in it. Nine o'clock looks like someone doing like the OK symbol with their fingers. It's kind of like that. 10 o'clock. Looks like an airplane. And 11 o'clock is like a circle with a line going through it and then a smaller circle. So that's our... That's our clock. I'm going to take a look at the broken clock and see if we have anything to go on here. Well, no, none of, the, none of these things are on this clock. I mean, if I just wanted to organize the circles as they are on, um... As they appear in the room, going from up and down from our perspective, it, uh... Would look kind of like this. Well, no, actually, the arrow at the bottom of the circle is... Let's see. If I... Let's see. Well, I don't think it's gonna be... I don't think it's gonna be that. I don't think it's going to be that. And so, looking at this again... And just, sorry, just comparing this to my drawing... Is there anything from Jeremy's book that would give us information about that? At this point, we have seen all four of these. I don't think our symbols that we're seeing here relate to that. And these are not... It's not the astrology symbols, I don't think. Well, we, it doesn't seem we have... That's been archived, so I guess we don't need that anyway. Since that's now gone to the archive. Oh, it was that. The center circle was off. Okay, never mind. Aha, uh -huh. and that's why we needed a key. You okay? You look a little frazzled. Just stupid telephone. 
I know. I tried calling the police earlier. The telephone is completely dead. It's not... Yeah, no, the telephone isn't working. Emily, you want to walk over here and take a look at something for me? Miss Hartwood, I think you're going to want to see this. Is there something in the closet? Yeah, there is. You don't see the very obvious gate leading to whatever Jeremy's madness is serving up next? I don't understand. Are you making some kind of fashion metaphor? I'm sorry, I don't have time for this. Can you just tell me what you're doing? You don't see this. It's fine. It's fine. Catch you later. Are you going inside the closet? Yeah. You got a problem with that? No. Do what you think is right, detective. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Goodbye, Miss Harwood. All right, in we go. Disheartened by his failure to make Emily understand what he was doing, Detective Conby actually felt better seeing the frozen hell before him. There was a finality to it. Its clear symbolic opposite to the dark man's desert made him realize this was the end. Soon it would all be over. Detective Conby was worried Emily could tell that she could see the madness written on his face. But what if he was the only one seeing the truth? Could that still be the case? If only he could find evidence that would make her understand that he had seen beyond the veil, or at least something that would show her he was worth the money she was paying him. Well, unfortunately, Carnby's on his own. Emily just can't see it. She's too stuck in the the world of mundanity. And is unable to experience the side that uh that Carnby's experiencing. Ice pick. Carnby doesn't seem cold. All right, well, we got a new gun. Hold to switch between guns. Okay. Ooh, a Lagni app. This will complete a set. This completes Prisoner of Ice. What can be said about Jacob van Ostad without evoking contempt or apologia? The first piece of information is the obvious. He is not the explorer Jeremy idolized in his youth, but the figment of his imagination. If you want biographical facts, I am not the one to answer such questions. In the case of Jeremy, he is a guardian of imagination. Or rather, a persona appointed the role of containing a self-sabotaging mania. However useful Jacob once was, his loyalty to Yermi has slowly been replaced by fanaticism. Like a firekeeper who has for decades been burnt by his own sacred flames, now does what he imagines the fire wants. Yermi has lost all control over Jacob and suffers greatly because of him, but is admittedly also still invigorated by his labor. In the plainest of words, Jacob keeps Yermi sick, so he can remain Yermi. A clue? Found the ancient Stellarium perched on a cliff facing the Arctic Ocean after a day of sailing due north of the Eskimo encampment. Jacob van Ostadt was our most keen member of the expedition. He had been chasing down the source of a peculiar type of crystallized metal present in several sacred items among the natives on the northeast coast of Greenland. The site was a remarkable find for any explorer, and we were all enraptured in our search for enlightenment and meaning. The surviving architecture seemed 
almost unearthly in origin and astonishingly sophisticated. The metal Jacob was searching for was abundant, almost ubiquitous. We were so taken by our find that we were surprised by the sun falling below the horizon. As we quickly picked up our gear, ready to head back to our camp, Jacob von Ostadt declared that he wanted to stay. He was adamant. We begged him to reconsider. The night would be getting colder by the hour, and we feared for all our safety. Jacob refused, threatening us with violence if we wouldn't leave him alone. As the snowfall turned heavier, we left him there on his own. The next day the weather became worse, and we had to spend hours enforcing our shelter as our tents became increasingly useless. The group had written off Jacob, thinking he must be dead. I had an urge to make one final attempt to save him, so I headed out as darkness fell with a handful of flares and headed toward the coast and up the climb, towards the Stellarium. That's when I saw him, transfixed by a burning sky, that celestial lantern. Jacob keeled over and let out a painful shriek that struck me with such fear and pity. He was crying in agony, for the cold weather had ravaged his flesh. I called out to him, and he turned to face me. His vacant stare held me in place like a needle through a butterfly, and he said, You must leave now, Hashtan. Go, and never come back. And so I left. Alright, maybe we can find the memory of Jacob around here. This sure is low visibility. We are still moving away. Is that Jacob up there? Don't mind me, I'm just taking your booze. Never know when you're gonna need some. Hey you! What are you doing here? What is this place? Whoa, take it easy. I'm not your enemy. Oh, you're wrong, detective. You're wrong. Uh, 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 ow. Uh, 
<laughs> Hold on. Oh, I needed I needed a swig. Needed a swig. Oh, it's bright. Well, okay, why don't we get out our, uh, our machine gun? Hey, you! What are you doing here? What is this place? Whoa, take it easy. I'm not your enemy. There we go. All right, what was he looking at? It's a tight lid. Oh, we got a giant talisman. Of course, the Taurus. I figured you wouldn't want your stars aligned, Jeremy, or ah, maybe that is what you need to temper that mania of yours. Is it supposed to be zoomed in like that? Oh, no space! You hate it when a portal of space appears right in front of you. Opened up the space portal. God's sake, stay dead, will you? Gotta find more bullets. Gotta find more bullets. Can we get him with the dagger in the eye? Ugh. Yeah, no, no, in the eye. Well, maybe it doesn't matter where it is. Maybe it can be anywhere. Either way, get... Get distracted. Gulp, gulp, gulp. Gulp, 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 gulp. Ow. Yeah, there we go. That's where it needs to be.
Jeremy? I did everything! Aren't you happy? Stupid charlatan! What more do you want from me? You want me to lose my mind? Oh, my love! Doctor! Baptiste! Quick! Jesus. What were you thinking, Compad? I guess you could just hit the dark man. It's it's all right. It's not really a big deal, really. I thought you'd be knocked out for the rest of the night. <laughs> Come on out and join us, will you? I'll save you some gumbo. Good to have you back. You gave us all a good scare. What happened? You had a psychological breakdown. Sorry for manhandling you, but you're being violent, you see. You stabbed Jeremy and then punched Dr. Gray. Are they okay? Jeremy's a little strange. But everything's back to normal. Really? All thanks to you, Combat. You want to try standing up? Well, if it isn't the hero of the day. How are you feeling, Detective? Never better. How about you two? Hey, Jeremy, I didn't do too much damage, did I? Things are fine. Very quiet. What's up with him? Painkillers? No. You see, despite you having the finesse of a one-eyed butcher, you managed to lobotomize, dear Jeremy. I did what? It's actually quite impressive. It's not like I hadn't considered it myself. I just wish Jeremy could have been helped without reducing his personality to that of an oyster. But he's gonna live. Of course. As long as someone keeps feeding him, he'll outlive the best of us. Well, oh no. I mean, I guess that technically solves Jeremy's problem, but not really in the way we wanted it to. Everything was back to normal. Did any of it really happen? What had Conby actually been doing all night? What had he been doing? Well, the doctor doesn't seem too put out about Carnby punching him. And, uh, well, I mean, the ritual with the snake knife did certainly resemble that of a lobotomy. Uh, I guess Carnby just had a really good aim with, well... Turns out he wasn't holding a dagger. Turns out he was uh, holding a different sort of implement that he stabbed through the uh, stabbed through the eye socket. And look at where we are. We're in the conservatory. It's all lit up. It's all pretty. And it's time to farewell Dorsetto, go back to New Orleans with Jeremy and Emily Hart. See, it's done. Game's over. It's all finished. Um, all we need to do now is just have one final night of celebration at Dorsetto, and then we can all leave, and everything's fine, probably. Uh, and I guess probably since now we've finished Chapter 4, that's uh, a good time to say goodnight as we begin Chapter 5. Which is not going to be a big deal, obviously. It's going to be a very calm, relaxed chapter where we walk out and, you know, just talk to everyone about their experiences 
here over the past uh, past day, and um, and we're just gonna leave. What a happy ending it was! What a happy ending. Uh, I guess probably Carnby should also apologize to Grace. You know, the real Grace. I don't know if the imaginary Grace counts as the real Grace. But, you know, maybe if we catch up with her, maybe Carnby can say sorry for, for killing her dad. Probably should do that. And, uh, well, you know, Jeremy, at least he's not gonna... At least, he, at least, I mean, he kind of technically has a different kind of problem, but at least his his previous problem seems to be done. Uh, though, on the other hand, I guess if Jeremy's... Does that count as severing Jeremy's contract with the Dark Man? Because apparently something bad was supposed to happen if, if that happened. It's probably fine. Nothing to worry about. Uh, we'll continue on with Alone in the Dark. <laughs>